Welcome to today's webinar, Maximizing Your Investment with Smart HVAC Decisions. My name is Tony Lang, and I'm the Associate Editor of Cannabis Business Times. In today's webinar, we're here to talk about some of the most important considerations in making an informed decision when investing in a commercial grow HVAC system. During this webinar, we'll discuss capital in, and in, install costs, energy use controllability, yield, and maintenance and downtime costs. First, a few housekeeping items. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you wish to submit any questions you may have throughout the presentation, make sure to drop your questions there and we'll try to answer as many of them as we can at the conclusion of the presentation. Also, we'll be emailing a recording of this webinar to all registrants. The video link will be available in five to seven days for your review. And now I'm pleased to welcome Jeff Brown, President, Vice President and Product and, I'm sorry, Vice President of Product and Business Development at Agronomic IQ. Thanks, Tony. Appreciate that uh, intro and uh, glad to see uh, you guys here taking the time out of your day uh, on this Wednesday afternoon. So very much appreciate you guys joining me. Um, like Tony said, uh, I've got a, a webinar for you here that's going to focus on uh, sort of the boogeyman that is HVAC and, and how to get the best return on your HVAC dollar investment. Um, over the course of this uh, webinar, uh, I'm going to talk about the capital and installed cost considerations, the time to market considerations, some yield and, and sort of general business development considerations, uh, as well as going through a, a couple of slides of some weird stuff that we see in the field uh, that are good watchouts for you as a facility owner, manager, uh, designer, or builder. Um, so without further ado, we'll get into it here. Um, so just a little bit of background, uh, like Tony said, I'm uh, Vice President of Product and Business Development uh, with Agronomic IQ. Agronomic IQ is uh, a brand of dehumidified air solutions, which is owned in turn by Madison Industries, which is a Chicago-based um, privately held manufacturing holdings company. Um, I first started in the industrial dehumidification space in 2003. Um, and I've spent now about 10 years on the application side. So starting in uh, early 2012 uh, in the uh, design uh, and sales side of uh, large natatorium dehumidifiers is, is ultimately where I came from with Stresco Technologies uh, prior to its acquisition by Dehumidified Air Solutions. And when that came about, uh, we saw an opportunity to transition uh, into the emerging at the time Canadian grow market um, and I was part of the product development team that created what is now the agronomic IQ brand of product. Also authored a, a book on the subject that's going to have its uh, newest edition coming out here very shortly. Um, again, trying to demystify some of the uh, HVAC parts in particular of grows. Um, anyways, we'll talk about that in a few minutes here. In terms of uh, Madison Industries, again, a uh, fairly large parent company, um, very large footprint uh, across North America as well as the world. Um, currently something like uh, 216 factories across 45 different countries. Uh, we're part of the Madison IAQ division, which is the indoor air quality division. Again, focused on bringing quality HVAC products to various different marketplaces. And, and some of the other companies within MIAQ that you may have heard of would be a Thermostore and Quest, for instance, or big ass fans. Um, so some, some really powerful brands uh, that allow us to uh, transition some internal knowledge, some supply chain, manufacturing capabilities, all sorts of things. Um, but I guess the, the point here is we're a very large company. We're not going anywhere. So we're really focused on this market. Um, Madison sees this as a growth opportunity for us and for North America generally. And so there's a huge focus on, on our marketplace and, and we're well positioned to take advantage of, of where this market is going. And um, fortunately we've got the, the, um, 
you know, the, the desire to be better at what we do and to continue to drive uh, thought leadership and uh, some really cool, innovative technology in terms of what we're supplying to the market. So over the course of this, uh, again, you know, uh, return on investment, obviously uh, you can't get a return on anything if you're not actually going to invest. Investment is the key part of that. And so how do you spend good money, uh, good smart money? You're gonna be spending money anyway. It, it's part of building a grow facility. Um, you don't have a choice. So how can you maximize what you're doing there? Um, but it is a multifaceted conversation. So there's a lot of different factors that go into this um, in terms of where you're spending money and, and where your long-term profitability is going to come from. A lot of, or I would say that most people understand the capital piece of equipment costs. You know, it's, it's the price tag that you see from day one. Installed costs can be a fair bit more nebulous, but then there's also the energy use costs, controllability, and in controllability here, I'm largely talking not just about how accurately or tightly a system controls your space, um, but also how much time you as a business owner have to focus on HVAC instead of the other parts of your, of your business. Um, ultimately, you know, you're in the business of growing quality product and packaging and shipping quality product. And if you're able to think about stuff that's not HVAC, you're able to do that more effectively. And, and again, that's uh, a piece of this conversation of, of this investment conversation is can a quality HVAC system free you up to focus on what you need to do? The yield from your facility, obviously very important. If you're able to increase your yield, everybody wants to, um, but if you're able to increase your yield, uh, it changes the economics of a facility in a, in a really, really big way. And then there's uh, sort of some of the ongoing costs of running the facility. Um, and so things like maintenance and then the uh, potential effects of, of downtime, um, and, and we can talk about some of those costs. And then uh, some of the resources, again, that we make available to the marketplace, uh, getting grow rooms right is one of those resources. We've got a couple of others that are available through our rep network as well. But let's hop into some of these cost items here. Um, you know, just in general terms, capital costs are the cost of the thing that you're buying. Um, so when we're looking at this, there's a bunch of different categories of equipment that you can buy. In general terms, um, the agronomic IQ product line is, it's a unitary piece of equipment. It's designed as a single piece of equipment that handles the entirety of your grow rooms, HVAC demands, heating, cooling, and dehumidification. Um, and we're cost competitive with unitary equipment, but we're going to be more capitally intensive than packaged cooling equipment, you know, a typical York carrier, Lennox rooftop, plus standalone dehumidification. Uh, we're gonna be significantly less expensive than a true custom air handling solution. And then there's the chilled water boogeyman that sort of exists in the corner. And, and that's a, a big, it depends. Um, the chilled water piece is um, probably the most challenging piece of this marketplace, particularly as the market continues to legitimize. Uh, you know, I've said it before, if you've seen some of my other webinars um, or, or seen me speak elsewhere, as the engineering community gets involved in these projects, there is still no guidance from groups like ASHRAE on it. And so in very large projects, the engineering community has tended in the past, uh, certainly uh, to focus on what they've done for very large, um, you know, 1500 ton, 2500 ton buildings and that's historically been central plan. You know, that, that's how you handle, generally speaking, a large office tower or university campus or big sports center or whatever. Um, and they can be applied successfully to this marketplace, but they're very expensive to do properly. And, and it's that doing properly piece that's challenging. And again, I, I've talked specifically about the difference in technology uh, in some other places, and I'm happy to answer some questions on it. But the long and short of it is, if you're going to properly design a chilled water system, it's both more expensive to install, it's more expensive to buy the capital equipment, and it's way more expensive to run, although you end up with very tight room control. So there's a, a bit of a, 
you know, there's, there's always a balancing act there. In terms of the installation costs, um, again, capital costs aren't, aren't the only piece. Um, we, would, we would ask that we're always looking at the total cost of an installed solution. Um, so that's the plumber, the electrician, your mechanical contractor doing duct work, um, everybody related to getting the equipment up and running successfully in that building. Um, and so integration, uh, for instance, between a building automation system and the room itself and ensuring that uh, the equipment is operating the way you're expecting it to for that room. And, and that's sort of that startup period. Uh, the longer that startup period takes, the longer it takes for you to achieve the full yields available from that facility and the longer it takes you to, to see a true return on your investment. So in general terms, unitary systems are quicker to install uh, and they're quicker to commission. Um, it's a single piece of equipment. You put it on the roof, you hook up ductwork power plumbing to it, and it's got integrated controls that make it very quick from that point on to, to move forward with. Um, you know, the, the don't ignore redundancy in particular is looking at things like chilled water. So if you're, if you're doing a big central plant system, by definition, it's a centralized system that feeds your whole facility. If your central system that feeding your whole facility goes down, you have a major, major problem on your hands. So how do you build in that redundancy in something like a central plant um, or any other facility or any other equipment type for that, that matter? Um, so always something to, to be aware of. And again, th this isn't a... Um, the answers to these questions are always going to be very, very specific to you and your facility and what your desired outcome from that facility is. So I can't sit here, sorry, I could sit here and tell you what to do, but I'm not going to be right for 99% of you. Every time this is a nuanced conversation with a lot of different factors. So what I'm trying to do here is provide some background into things that you should be looking at, things you should be considering. And again, I'll show you some, some pictures of what happens to some of these facilities uh, later in, in their lifetime and how to avoid some of the problems that we see. So controls and maintenance. Um, the controls piece certainly could be lumped in with the installed cost, although I want to call it out specifically um, because if you've got a facility, you need to have the capacity to have it do what you want it to. Um, you need to be able to tie in you know, your lighting control with your HVAC control. You need to be able to sense the room conditions properly. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways of doing that, but you need to ensure that your equipment is controlling to the temperature that you want it to uh, and, and you know, basically accurately controlling the space. And so uh, again, with unitary equipment, you've got a built-in control system, you've got built-in sensing, and then you can take uh, third-party sensors or canopy sensors or something like that to augment that system with basically all of the other types whether it's a you know packaged cooling plus standalone or a custom system of some kind whether that's chilled water or or other custom unitary equipment um, the controls piece is going to be up to a local controls integrator to manage and that piece can both take a long time and cost a lot of money um, and there are lots of people who are, are jumping into this uh, marketplace with both feet and you know, they're, they're seeing it as a bit of a gold mine and uh, I understand why. That said, if you're relying on you know, a large building automation provider to give you a solution, you're actually relying on a local company to integrate that solution for you who may or may not have ever worked in a growth facility before. So, there's always some caution there in terms of how standard can you get with controls? Is there something off the shelf or a known integrator that you can work with? Uh, you don't want to be somebody's R&D project. In terms of, again, the, the controls and maintenance piece, uh, the number of overall units in your facility, the number of individual units, um, the more units you have, the more redundancy you have, but the more points of failure you have and the more things that you need to either fix or clean or replace. So, you know, I'm talking about filters, for instance. If you've got 30 small dehumidifiers serving a space and you have to change 
those filters between every cycle, there's a cost associated with that. There's a cost associated with putting a maintenance guy on a ladder and having him actually change those filters. And then if you have a, a contamination event or if you're uh, in a, a jurisdiction requiring it, um, you know, needing to clean those units on or between every cycle, it, again, represents a pretty significant cost or the opportunity to have a pretty significant cost. So all of these things factor into your overall cost of ownership. Uh, and obviously the, the service and warranty offering that accompanies units is very important. So in general terms, unitary equipment you know, has a warranty. Uh, it has a single person that is responsible for it. Um, you wanna ensure that the person you're buying from is the OEM. So you don't want to end up in a situation where the brand of equipment you bought isn't manufactured by that person and there's uh, the, the sort of necessary finger pointing that exists uh, between the, the person you bought it from and the actual manufacturer of that equipment who's responsible for offering service uh, or warranty repairs or whatever. Um, you know, these are th questions that you wanna ask early in the system, early in, in the unit design or the system design. Another factor, of course, is energy use. Um, these facilities are energy pigs. It's something that everybody's aware of, um, but it matters. So one of the, the biggest factors, in, at least in terms of energy use for unitary equipment is because properly designed unitary equipment is able to use 100% of the compressor waste heat, you've got the capacity to um, reheat for free effectively. Anytime you've got a compressor operating either in cooling or dehumidification, you've got enough energy in that system to make up all of your reheat. It means that you're not burning BTUs on both sides. And again, as this market matures and as the impact of this market matures, um, it's really important to ensure that we stay compliant with some of the existing rules that are currently not being enforced. So one example there, uh, there's been a DOE rule on the books for a long time that says you can't pay for both heating and cooling BTUs in the same space at the same time. Again, this rule is largely ignored, um, but the last count I saw, which was a 2019 number, showed that indoor cannabis facilities in North America accounted for something like three and a half percent of North America's energy use. I suspect that number is quite, you know, it's quite a bit larger today. Um, and so as that number gets bigger and bigger, you know, we're going to see a repeat of the data center uh, stuff of the 90s, where there's much more focus on drawing that into an energy efficient uh, or as energy efficient as possible. And as a result, enforcing some of these existing rules. So again, in the short term, you're able to achieve significant energy savings by just not paying for both sides. You're not paying to cool waste heat from a dehumidifier, or you're not paying to reheat a chilled water system that's using you know, fairly cold chilled water to achieve the dehumidification you need, um, but you still need to be able to you know, keep the air warm enough that you're not killing your plants. In the short term, you know, again, there's an energy savings. In the long term, there's code compliance that's going to become uh, more of a factor here. And one of the tools that we've built is an energy calculator um, that allows us to, to compare some common solutions with um, the Quest IQ, or the uh, Agronomic IQ solution and what that looks like. In general, uh, the unitary systems with integrated reheat, again, have a, something like a 30 to 50% savings in annual energy use. And that represents you know, 15 to 25% of the capital cost of that equipment on a, on a per year basis. So when you're looking at the overall, again, return on investment of your facility, um, that capital cost or that, that energy use reduction is important, obviously uh, makes a bigger difference in a place like Puerto Rico where you're paying, you know, 25 to 30 cents a kilowatt hour versus Oklahoma at seven or eight, um, but regardless. The other piece is uh, as a result of this calculator and some other things, uh, we've managed to support more than a million dollars in utility rebates over the last year. Um, and so a utility rebate is basically just an incentive to buy something that the utility considers to be more efficient. Um, utilities are incenting, peer, incenting facilities to do this because there's a real cost associated with the utility increasing available electrical infrastructure 
And so if they can avoid doing that or offset some of that cost, uh, they're generally willing to give some of it back. And, and so uh, that's one piece that we actively help our customers with. And again, through uh, Rep Network uh, and other partners actively work on. And, and basically we produce an output that looks something like this. Um, and so this is, this is one we've done for a flower facility um, using Colorado as a, uh, you know, this, this one's using Buckley Air Force Base in terms of weather data. And we uh, have a fair bit of calculation that goes on in the background, but you'll see that in general terms, we're again, between that 25 and 50% energy savings. This one happens to be about a 35% energy savings on an annualized basis. Um, the thing that makes a big difference here though, and, and the piece that I really wanna draw your attention to is on the left side, you'll see there's an energy savings number 26 grand a year. 26 grand a year is a very solid number in energy savings. And again, it represents in this case about a 15% savings on the capital equipment per year. Great. But the yield boost piece matters way more. Um, so 26 grand in energy savings, awesome. 500 grand in yield boost. Well, what does that mean and how do we achieve it? Uh, and so I'll get there in just one second. Uh, just another quick reminder again, uh, if there are any questions that you guys want me to answer, uh, please throw them in the question and answer uh, bucket within the Zoom uh, window, uh, and we'll get to them at the end. Um, and we'll uh, talk about, um, you know, answer what I can and uh, again, email out a, a copy of those questions and answers, uh, you know, follow up here. So in terms of uh, the yield boost, you know, we've got a couple of numbers here, um, budgeted yield per square foot a number, you know, a business plan number is very typically something like 55 grams a square foot. That happens to be roughly the average. Um, and our, you know, bulk price per pound uh, varies wildly, but $1,550 per pound was the uh, 2020 average, again, really depends on what you're growing and for what purpose. If you're growing a very consistent craft flower, you're gonna achieve well better than 1550 a pound. Um, and if you're growing outdoor, um, not really part of this conversation, but if you're growing outdoor uh, just for biomass to feed into extraction, you're probably not achieving that much. These are where these numbers come from. Uh, again, this is CBT. Um, had, had done this survey and that 55 grams a square foot is, is really sort of the average. Um, so when we're talking about yield, what does this mean? Well, a bunch of different things. Your facility has an opportunity cost in delay. So the longer it takes your facility to get up and running with whatever HVAC solution or, or your construction timeline, as well as how long it takes you to get your facility running optimally. So if you're able to build your facility very quickly, but it takes you a year to get it running well, there's a cost associated with that. And the number is something like $2 a square foot of canopy per day. So it's a huge cost that I think is largely ignored uh, in this market, unfortunately. Um, from our perspective, we're able to help achieve better yields by controlling the room more accurately. The more accurately we can control the room, the more time and energy your grower can focus on the other pillars of good yield, that is fertigation and lighting. Again, the, the things that growers really focus on. I find that in general terms, when we're talking to facilities that are, are maybe not doing as well as they'd like to be, they find their HVAC to be a distraction. It's something that it's a black box on the roof. It may do stuff, but we don't really understand how or why it does what it does. And it's never right. And so, like I say, it's a distraction. It's a distraction for your grower. It's a distraction for your management team who really ought to be focused on, hey, can I make my business more efficient? And hey, how do I expand? How do I get more capital to build another building? Um, and so from our perspective, we want to partner with you to ensure that your HVAC is easy. And when we're talking about ROI, something as small as a half gram improvement per square foot, 1%, which is absolutely nothing, um, 
can represent like 60% of the capital cost of HVAC on that room. It's the single biggest piece of the ROI, um, you know, the ROI uh, analysis really. Um, and we have many facilities that are well north of 100 grams a square foot in terms of production. So that's a, a, again, a huge difference. If you're budgeting 55 and you end up at 70 or 80, um, that obviously does huge things for your business and, and your business plan overall. Obviously harder to guarantee, right? I'm not in control of your fertigation, of your lighting, of your growth schedule, of contamination, of a whole bunch of other things. Um, but my goal or our goal when we're applying HVAC to a facility is I want to remove the distraction of HVAC. I want you to be able to trust that your HVAC is going to work. It is mechanical equipment. It does require some, some you know, love and care and attention like all mechanical equipment does. But in general terms, I want you to be focused on growing. And that's really what it's about. And when we're talking about controlling a room more accurately, we're talking about a room that looks like this. So the room on the right is an Ag IQ controlled room. The room on the left is typical um, HVAC with standalone dehumidification. And so what you can see is one, much more accurate temperature control. Um, we're not either above or below target, we're really bang on over the course of that cycle and much more accurate humidity control as well. And every time the humidity either goes well above target or well below target, you've stressed out your plant. You're forcing it to either, you know, when, when your humidity is too high, you may be dealing with some microbial contamination or at risk of it, but you're also slowing down transfer, transpiration from the plant leaf and slowing down its growth ultimately. Similarly, if your room's too dry, your plant is stressed out, it's going into a drought mode and it's not going to be growing as much. So this is one of those things that the more accurate you can control it, the more accurately um, we're able to, to basically, you know, put the control in the hands of your grower. You can also, you know, if you have aspirations or if you are a multi-state operator, if you don't have tight room control, how do you determine which of your growers have a good recipe, which of your growers are doing well versus which of them are, you know, saying, hey, HVAC's the problem, not me. Um, so from a management perspective, it, it really is a, um, again, we're trying to make it easier, trying to, trying to allow you to focus on the business of growing and not on the HVAC side. Here's another example of, again, a similar room um, with much more tightly controlled conditions. And again, you can see, you know, in this case, there's a 20% relative humidity swing in that room on the left. And, uh, you know, we're, we're sub 10% in the room controlled by Ag IQ. So, you know, we're controlling it in, in gross numbers about 50% tighter, although you can obviously see that it's a much more stable environment as well. This also has an energy impact uh, to your facility. So when you're banging stuff on and off, uh, which is ultimately what's happening here. You've got a, a you know standalone dehumidifier or a packaged air conditioner that, okay, my room's too hot. I'm going to turn on 100%. I'm going to drag the room down until I'm at my low dead band set point. I'm going to turn off. I'm going to wait for the room to heat back up and rinse repeat. There's no modulation in control there. Um, and so not only is your room environment not that stable, um, but it's also an energy pig as a result. And so the rooms that we're seeing here are uh, treated by our flagship equipment, and that is the compressor wall units. Um, if you guys are familiar at all with uh, fan arrays or um, that kind of concept, we've basically taken that and applied it to compressor circuits instead. So um, instead of having a couple of large compressor circuits, we've got many small compressor circuits and each one of those compressor circuits is still served by a two stage compressor. So you end up with a lot of stages of control available in these, which allows them to tailor themselves very nicely to the room demands. Um, so outdoor equipment from 10 to 121 tons. Um, so small rooms are large. 
we always recommend or would always recommend having multiple pieces of equipment per room just for redundancy sake. Um, you know, a minimum of two units per room is, is generally a good practice. Again, because each of those compressors is a two-stage compressor in low speed, they're primarily sensible. Uh, that is the air conditioning piece. And in high speed, we add the latent back end, the dehumidification piece. So we're able to turn those compressor circuits on or off and at different stages, again, to very tightly tailor the room or, or the, the work that we're applying to the room to the room demands, the stage of your plants, whether they're, you know, if you're a veg in place, whether those plants are small um, and as you know, following them through the flower cycle, through sort of week six of flower where your dehumidification demand is, is absolute peak. Uh, and then back again, as that flower cycle ends, you start cooling things off, drying things down. We, we can tailor our capacity to it very, very tightly. And um, you know, there's a couple of, of, of quote unquote weird things about these, uh, units that are done for a very good reason. Uh, one, they're all water cooled or, or glycol cooled. Um, we have a uh, packaged configuration available for all of the units uh, or they can be done as site splits or split uh, fluid cooled units. But we're using a glycol cooler because it allows us to completely isolate the refrigeration circuits, those, those small pods that I talked about from what's happening outside. And so it means that in particular with low ambient conditions, so when it's cold outside, we're able to still do full cooling and dehumidification um, without having the compressor circuit need to work in a minus 20 or minus 30 or minus 40 degree environment. And we have these units successfully deployed in places like Edmonton um, that are unnecessarily cold and people frankly, you know, uh, I struggle to understand why people live there. Different story for another day. Um, obviously, you know, we do these in uh, pad mount or roof mount configurations. So, you know, in this case, we see a, a pad mount version with top supply and top return. They're available as downflow, bottom supply, bottom return, as well as horizontal or left or right uh, configurations. So really work with your building designer, your engineer on a site um, to figure out what works best for them. Um, again, designed for the cannabis market, um, designed for operating in a high enthalpy environment in the cold or the heat. And so when I say a high enthalpy environment, one of the, again, the challenges with standard rooftop equipment is you've got a box on the roof. And if you turn that box off and it's not designed for it, well, that box is going to get wet because the box is going to be cold, there's no air flowing through it, and you're going to have condensation problems in it. And again, this is one of the challenges with on-off control of typical HVAC is you end up with a bunch of other problems that sort of come out of it. Um, so again, this is typically how we would uh, apply uh, equipment to a facility. Um, we are going to be releasing a new style of indoor unit uh, quite soon. So I can, can provide a bit of a teaser there. Basically what we're doing is we're taking the compressor wall technology, multiple small two-stage compressor circuits and dragging those into our indoor footprint, uh, which is a little more compact. Generally speaking, we see indoor equipment applied to greenfield buildings. Um, retrofit buildings tend to have outdoor equipment. And so it's going to depend on you know, your specific needs. There is no right answer. Both a, you know, both apply work to a room very effectively. It, it really just is what is best for you and your designer. So I just want to talk uh, or maybe uh, generate some questions or generate some uh, concepts about your, you know, some, sorry. I'm going to go through a couple of pictures around some facilities we've seen, stuff that we've seen done. Um, and I want to understand from you whether you see similar stuff in either facilities you're involved with or have similar um, challenges that exist. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have on the subject. But you know, here's an example of a grower that ultimately just didn't choose the right partner to build their building. And so what we've got here is the top of a grow room. Uh, this is a flower room. And this grower, 
has elected to use disposable ductwork um, with the intent of throwing it out between every flower cycle. They've got you know typical double end discharge at the top of their room. They've got high supply uh, and high return for, or sorry, these, these return grills here uh, are in the ceiling and they've got their supply up high. Obviously not, uh, you know, that ductwork isn't going to be getting air anywhere useful. They've got no air devices in the room to mix the room in any way. Um, so in general terms, I'm not a fan of air rotation fans in a space. Um, they basically are, are energy pigs. They're, they're not particularly efficient at moving air around. Uh, and they tend to be applied uh, uni more universally than they ought to be. You can achieve good air movement in the space just with good ductwork design uh, and not have that energy penalty of that extra set of fans. Um, again, any plug load in that space, any energy you spend in that space, you also have to spend in energy cooling that energy, right? So if you have a horsepower of fan in your room, you've now got an extra, call it 3000 BTUs that you have to cool every hour. So there's an energy cost to running the fans and then there's a second energy cost in cooling the fan energy. But in this case, uh, there are no air rotation fans. There's nothing getting the air to a good part of the room. And this was allegedly demanded by the master grower, this configuration. They've used this before, they know it works. Uh, ultimately, unfortunately, not a uh, productive space. And so the simple fix to this is get ductwork with air devices that point in the right direction. If you get air to the plants, you've solved the problem. Um, and so ductwork is not a particularly expensive thing to do. It is a cost that, that I think sometimes sneaks up on people, um, but we're talking about maybe 10% of the capital cost of equipment on a, on a particular room in ductwork. And so if you're able to save energy in air rotation fans and achieve better results from that room, that little bit of money in a one-time ductwork cost is, is really uh, smart. In this case as well, of course, um, different facility, but this is a facility that's got a high return system, their return up down, or sorry, their return up high is reading basically the temperature right off the lights. They are not measuring temperature at the canopy level. And so this room in particular, when I took this measurement, you know, that measurement says 64 degrees Fahrenheit, the room was, was downright chilly, um, but the equipment was seeing an 85 degree return air temperature. So about a 20 degree spread between what the canopy is seeing and what the equipment is seeing. And that's in indicative of poor air distribution, poor mixing in the space. And again, that air distribution uh, can be accomplished with good ductwork design, with air rotation fans intelligently placed. Uh, again, that's one of those things that we see all the time is uh, growers are very good at creating horizontal air curtains in their room. They've got a bunch of uh, air rotation fans pointing sideways high supply, high return, and then wonder why no air gets down low. Well, I mean, you've all walked into a Costco or a Target and had the fans blow on you. Well, it's, it's literally creating an air curtain. It's designed to block mixing between inside and outside. And if you do that with your air rotation fans, you're gonna accomplish exactly the same thing. So intelligently applied um, air distribution is, is really, really important. In this case, again, uh, another facility that was built by, in this case, uh, a new builder to the market, this was their first facility, and didn't understand that the application of a wall-mounted thermostat, nowhere near the lights and nowhere near air distribution, wasn't going to accurately measure their space temperature. Seems obvious. Uh, everybody who's been in one of these rooms before understands the impact of the lights, but there you go. And so again, I think my message there is you want a company, a construction partner, an HVAC partner, an engineering partner uh, that's invested in your success, right? This is a, a market where 
it's easy to have things go wrong and you want somebody who's going to be there and stand with you through thick and thin and ensure that um, things go well for you ultimately. Same facility as, as that last picture. Uh, that is a, a return air grill in the hallway. So this is not part of the grow room, um, but obviously there's light leakage between the grow room and the hallway. Well, light leaks in both directions, obviously enough, which means that if that hallway light is on during the lights off cycle of flower, you've got a light problem. Again, I think my message here is there's lots of little things like this that people who work in this industry a lot, who visit a lot of facilities see. There isn't a person out there who would ever consider opening the door between a lights on hallway and a lights off flower room. So why would you accept air leakage like this or light leakage like this? Now, of course, if you've got light leakage like this, you probably also have air leakage, which means that you've got a direct path between your hallway and your grow rooms, which means that you know, you've got the capacity for contamination again through all of those facilities. Um, so get somebody who, who understands what they're doing and be involved in the process, right? You want to ensure that you've got um, visibility into these things, that you're not just blindly trusting, you know, th this is a trust but verify. Um, watch what's happening, ask questions, ensure that when you're signing off on a room or a facility that you're truly happy with it uh, and that you understand any, you know, any deviations from your spec, you understand why a contractor changed the basis of design, you know, ensure that they're not doing that to um, add some extra money to their pocket, but they've got your best interest in mind. Again, you're looking for a partner, uh, not somebody to blindly make money at your expense. So that's uh, about it for my main presentation. I'll take some questions now, uh, if you guys have any, and you see some that have popped up. Tony, were you going to read them out or? Um, is that the yeah, point? yeah, I can do that for you, Jeff. So yeah, sure. Just, just a reminder, if if the Q&A box is open still throughout the Q&A here. So if you have follow-ups or want to ask a question, drop your, uh, drop your question down there at the bottom of your screen. Um, well, let me just start off with a question from Nicholas here. Um, he's asking how many times per hour should I re renew the air in my indoor grow room? Uh, what a great question. So uh, I'm going to say there probably isn't a right answer to this. Uh, if you're not going to be able to, you know, if you're not supplementing CO2, then the answer is quite often. Uh, you're probably looking for, you know, three to six fresh air changes an hour. Uh, if you're supplementing CO2, the, the current sort of at least best industry practice would be you're probably having a sealed room altogether. Um, CO2 is a surprisingly expensive um, it's probably going to be your single biggest cost after power. Um, and so most people would then say, you know, if you're supplementing CO2 um, to not introduce any outside air or any fresh air changes over the course of your lights on cycle, uh, and then there's some, um, again, some facilities are, are experimenting with different things, uh, but I suspect that it's probably worth your while um, to do a fresh air change or two uh, during the lights off cycle, introduce some outside air, some fresh air. Um, again, you have to be careful about introducing contaminants. Um, you certainly don't want to introduce um, any, you know, if you're in an area, Southern Ontario, for instance, there's lots of either greenhouse or outdoor grows. Uh, you certainly wouldn't want to be introducing a lot of outside air uh, with other grow facilities in your area for fear of either contamination or pollination. Um, so again, it's going to be a very site specific conversation. But again, I, I would say in general, three to six air changes, fresh air changes per hour if you're not supplementing CO2. And if you are, again, general best practice there is probably no fresh air changes during the lights on. Uh, with an air exchange or two at the beginning of the lights off cycle. Right, okay. 
And then uh, this question from is from Wayne. Um, said this might be outside the scope of this webinar, but how does agronomic IQ control the sensible heat ratio? And also how is that set point set by a user or is it based on other set points? Yeah, so that, I mean, this is uh, getting into the weeds of control algorithms, but basically the user sets a target temperature and relative humidity for the space. Um, so, you know, just for grins, middle of middle of a flower cycle, 76 degrees Fahrenheit and 55% relative humidity would be, again, not atypical. Um, and so in setting that in the equipment, the equipment will then look at the airstream either coming back to the equipment. So I see another question there around uh, air changes per hour independent of outside air. We're generally seeing with our equipment between 40 and 60 air changes per hour, which means that that air coming back to the unit, if you've got good air distribution in your room and good mixing is going to be very representative of your canopy temperatures. But the air coming back or the air that we're controlling to, whether that's a canopy sensor or the return air, will then define an operating mode for the unit. Are we in cooling, heating, dehumidification, or some combination thereof, right? You can, you can cool and dehumidify at the same time, or you can heat and dehumidify at the same time. And then on the basis of that, if we're targeting cooling, uh, there's a couple of different things we can do. We can run compressors in low speed, which is a sensible primary mode uh, to reduce the amount of dehumidification that each of those pods do. We can increase the airflow rate through the unit to, again, to increase sensible heat ratio. Um, we can increase or close the bypass damper on indoor equipment to increase the, uh, again, airflow rate through the evaporator coil, again, to reduce the sensible heat rate, or sorry, increase the sensible heat ratio, reduce the amount of dehumidification we do. Um, and vice versa, all of those things work, right? We can, if we're in a dehumidification primary mode, we would kick on a compressor at full speed, get full latent cooling out of it, do as much dehumidification as we can, and then have as little, quote unquote, waste cooling as possible. Um, you can also, slow down the air through coils to accomplish a similar thing, or again, to, to change that sensible heat ratio. That's all done internally um, to the unit. And so that's not an algorithm that is controlled by the user or that needs to be programmed by uh, a local controls integrator. Um, that's, I think, probably the biggest benefit of unitary equipment is that stuff is all baked in. We've got thousands of units out in the field with control algorithm, you know, with our control algorithm that does this stuff for you, basically. Okay. Then um, got a question from Tony here. At, at what point would it be reasonable to integrate agronomic IQ with the design team for an indoor, indoor grow? Generally speaking, as early in the process as possible. Um, you know, once you have the, the basics set, um, you know, it's, it's hard for us to size equipment if you don't know what kind of lighting you're using or how big your rooms are. Um, but ultimately, the earlier in the process we're integrated, the easier it is to fit our equipment or any equipment into that facility. So one of the things that we could do, for instance, is say, hey, if you want to design around 55 ton pieces of equipment and you want two of those per room, well, here's the maximum room size that you can get. So if you were considering having slightly smaller rooms or slightly larger rooms, well, you may have some wasted equipment or some wasted floor space as a result. So working with your design team early can help us optimize a facility with you know, unit configuration or tonnages versus individual room sizes even versus lighting type. Um, so I would say that there's never too early an opportunity. Um, we're probably the next call after deciding on an architect and an engineer. Gotcha. This one's from Joseph. Um, are you, de are you de dehumidifying to the point where you're producing enough condensation flow to warrant the need for heat trace during winters? Yes, absolutely. So uh, in general, if you've got rooftop equipment, we would prefer to have 
just a bottom drain connection that goes through the roof curb and so stays in a conditioned space. Uh, if you're going to be throwing uh, or having a side condensate drain either onto a roof or you know the, that picture I showed of equipment uh, on a pad in a parking lot, uh, it will need to be heat traced. A 120 ton unit will produce something like 400 pounds an hour of water, um, maybe a little more to that depending on your conditions. And so you could very quickly end up with a very large skating rink in the winter. And it's a, it's a significant concern. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, condensate management and preventing that from freezing is very important. And again, a very typical consideration of any dehumidification equipment outside. Mm -hmm. That said, if you were to be building a greenfield building, uh, part of the reason that Canada sees a lot of indoor equipment is because it's cold out and maintaining equipment on a roof in the winter sucks. Um, and all of these other issues that, that sort of accompany that, like heat trace and condensate lines, can be a problem. Um, if your equipment's indoors, obviously you don't have any of that concern. Right. And then um, this question's from Michael. He's talking a little bit about the HVAC relationship with, with lighting. Um, have you observed significant differences in HVAC slash deload between HID lighting and LED lighting operations? And can you quantify that difference for us? So the short answer is yes, there's significant differences between them um, in a couple of different ways. So there's, you know, people are applying LED lighting either in an effort to reduce their lighting wattage or to increase their micromole density. And so basically, you know, if, if you were a discharge facility at 50 watts a square foot, you can probably achieve pretty close to the same PPFD with 35 watts a square foot of LED, or you can increase your lighting intensity by using 50 watts a square foot of LED. In both cases, it affects your HVAC system differently. So if you're going to just use LED as a way to reduce your lighting energy, what you generally do is you reduce your leaf temperature. Um, and so what that means is that you run your room hotter to maintain a similar leaf temperature to what you would do under discharge lights. Again, you're not getting that same amount of infrared radiation off the lights. And so your leaf temperatures generally end up colder with equivalent air temperatures. And so you need to reset your whole facility hotter and thus to stay, and you know, as a result of that, to stay in the same band of the VPD, uh, you need to run more humid as well. And so it very much changes the sensible heat ratio target of equipment. Um, so, Generally speaking, um, it's something that, that's not a drop in replacement, or at least it's going to require uh, a lot of consultation with an HVAC manufacturer. It's not, you know, that's not an nth hour change to go from discharge to LED and, and just hope that everything will be okay. It's a pretty significant change uh, in terms of your overall um, HVAC need. Now, there's still you know, ultimately it is a system, a watt in is a watt out or a watt in is a watt that an HVAC system needs to deal with. So uh, we're just changing the ratio between dehumidification watts and uh, sensible cooling or, or air conditioning watts in that. You know, that's ultimately the, the sort of end goal there. Um, but yeah, the, the, the difference is, is pretty significant. And again, is mostly in terms of the difference in temperature that you're running the room and thus, you know, air on temperature for coils, sensible heat ratio for the equipment itself. Right, gotcha. Um, Kurt, Curtis from uh, Saskatchewan has a question here about his, uh, said he's designing a micro cultivation, uh, 2,152 square foot uh, operation in Canada. He's talking about having a 1700 square foot bloom room, 180 square foot mother room, and a 220 square foot veg slash clone room. Um, do you have any recommendations for those varying room sizes and um, the different cycles of growth stages there for him? Yeah, so, you know, in general terms, this would come into our client intake 
And, and what we would be looking for from Curtis or any other grower is, let's talk about your rooms. What kind of lighting do you have? What kind of desired temperatures do you have? And what's your end goal? Generally speaking in Canada, micro are, are doing high quality dried flour as an output product, um, which means that in general, um, you'd be looking for pretty tight control of your space, um, but you're also, you may have very specific um, demands in terms of temperature and relative humidity, particularly towards the end of a cycle. Again, especially if you're intending to get a particular color or terpene content or, or something like that. So our, our client intake form would look at how big are your rooms? What kind of lighting are in your rooms? What kind of watering rate are you doing? Um, you know, we really want to know everything about your facility in order to better understand what you're doing and how our equipment may or may not be suitable for it. And again, your different room sizes. And, and so basically all new growers go, or all new customers of ours go through the same intake process there. Um, filling out that form that is enough for us to start a conversation with you uh, to start understanding your grow and, and what you're doing, what you're wanting to accomplish and, and how we can best help with that. Yeah, and there's a, a few general questions uh, revolving around, you know, the next steps people can take if they want to make the, the investment to, a, you know, unitary equipment here. And um, Curtis and some other people who have some follow-up questions about install time and all that, um, definitely in the chat box, um, Jeff's email is available there, and we can also follow up with you after the meeting. Um, maybe one or two more quick questions here for you, Jeff, if you have time. Um, can you talk a little bit about, and this question's from Al, um, can you talk a little bit about the efficiency of your system versus that of desiccate systems or typical systems that maybe aren't necessarily designed for the specific purposes that um, agronomic IQ um, designs its systems for? Yeah, sure. So uh, in, in, again, I'm, I'm gonna speak very generally here because it's hard to be 100% accurate 100% of the time, not knowing what type of desiccant we're talking about. There are some interesting technologies with liquid desiccants um, that can offer both cooling and dehumidification in a quite efficient way. Um, the challenge generally with liquid desiccants is they tend to be quite to extremely corrosive. Um, and so provide some challenges generally to equipment, to um, ductwork to piping to you know your facility generally uh, as well as sometimes being quite toxic traditional desiccant system you know the, the stuff that most people think of when they're talking about desiccant is using effectively silica gel the same stuff that you get in electronics um, and uh, is a very energy dense process so by running a desiccant wheel, you run a process airstream through that, the desiccant media absorbs the moisture, and then you need to have a regeneration system uh, that's typically either electrically or gas fired, but that heats that desiccant media and basically burns off the water uh, into that, that regeneration airstream. The net effect of that is, is a quite high energy use um, and an energy or sorry a heat source for your space so that because that wheel is getting regenerated and getting hot the process air that goes through that wheel tends to also heat up and so you may have a net heating effect from that that may or may not be desirable so where do you apply desiccants appropriately or most appropriately in this marketplace i would argue that the most appropriate place would be uh, drying rooms uh, would be a good example. Desiccant systems are, are, are capable of very accurate dehumidification control um, and applying a very consistent dehumidification amount or quantity, you know, pounds per hour um, or delta grains to an airstream um, across a very wide range of temperatures. So if you wanted to dry, for instance, at 60 degrees Fahrenheit and a 40% relative humidity, you have a very low dew point. You've got a dew point that's lower than uh, DX or any direct expansion dehumidifier can achieve. Your only option at that point is to go desiccant. Um, and so it would be generally not the most efficient application, certainly not the most efficient application for a flower room or a veg room, uh, but maybe the most appropriate 
for a drying room or uh, an extraction space or processing space of some other form. Last thing here, and, and uh, again, if, if we didn't get a chance to go over your questions, um, we will follow up with you and you can also follow up with Jeff um, directly uh, following the, the webinar here by email. Um, just a basic question from Herschel here. Um, he's asking if you have a white paper or primer on HVAC for the cannabis industry. Um, I'm sure the short answer is yes, but are there, I guess, are there any avenues or places that people can go to get more educated on some of the nuances with, with HVAC and what exactly uh, um, their investment would include if, if they choose to partner with Agronomic IQ? Yeah, so I think the best place there is, is just to drive to our website, agronomiciq.com. Um, we do have a number of white papers, some case studies, things like that uh, on the website. Um, you can also get, a, get in touch with us directly, you know, either, either myself directly or our sales team. Um, you know, obviously the sales team is, is a little more involved in the day-to-day -day, uh, sales operation of our business than I am at this point. Uh, I've transitioned out of that and really focusing on uh, new product development and, and understanding the needs of the industry and how to integrate that into our product line. So that's, that's been a fun transition for me uh, in all honesty. Um, but ultimately, you know, Herschel and anyone else, the, the best place for resources is, is our website. Uh, and if you're not finding what you're looking for on the website, then get in touch with us and we'll happily help you out there. Right. Well, again, sorry if uh, I know we didn't get to some of your questions here and uh, we're going to have to cut it off there, but a video link of this webinar will be sent to all the registrants. Um, give us maybe five to seven business days on that, um, possibly sooner. But, you know, I want to thank you again, Jeff, for uh, joining us and for your presentation. And I want to thank everyone who uh, came in and, and listens and asked questions. Um, and that'll be, that'll be, a, we'll wrap it up there. So. Awesome. Thanks very much for the time, guys. Thanks, Tony, for putting this together and uh, hopefully we'll chat with you soon. Our pleasure. Take care.